I'd say out of the three of us, Emma is probably the most hardcore of a gamer. Freddie, would you describe yourself as a gamer or like a casual gamer? Well, let's see. For the past few weeks, I've been playing Star Wars Galaxies. So it's just trying to get me out of the game that I've been playing for, who knows, like 20 <laughs> years. <laughs> okay, okay. You're, so you're a hardcore gamer with one game. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm the same way with Pokemon Trading Card Game Online. <sighs> we do love our Pokemon here. But there's another game that has just been announced, Freddy, that... Uh, is seems very legends look back we might have to do like a legends look back uh live stream like in the discord or something just for just for the community have you heard about this yet uh and emma obviously would be the best at it because she's definitely more of a gamer than any of us i've seen her play battlefront um there's this game have you heard about this yet freddie called nickelodeon all-star brawl i have not heard of that <laughs> so uh you've you played super smash brothers right yeah of course only on the n64 um I've played on on several systems. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, <laughs> um, Melee is probably the best one, but uh, yeah, yeah. I've probably put in the most time on N64. Anyway, so it's going to be that, but with classic Nickelodeon characters. Here's my question. As, uh, you know, obviously the classic era of Nickelodeon shows, who do you think would be better in a fight? The Angry Beavers, Nigel Thornberry, Reptar from Rugrats, Patrick Starr from SpongeBob, or like uh, the fairy, the fairy can't even say this, the fairy godparents from the fairly odd parents. Say that five times fast. <laughs> Who do you think is going to be your character of choice in Nickelodeon All Star Brawl, Freddy? Uh, I'm going to go off the the list here. I'm going to go with Quail Man. Oh, oh, what's he from? Doug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, is that Nickelodeon? There's a Disney and a Nickelodeon version of Doug, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm going with the Nickelodeon version. I don't, I don't know about that Disney version. So this is weird. I've met the daughters of the guy that created Doug. Oh, really? That's interesting. The creator went to my alma mater. Uh, I'm repping their gear here tonight. Um, yeah, so they live up in Maine. I won't give any more details on that, but like, uh, <laughs> they're always like, maybe you've heard of us. Our dad created Doug. <laughs> <laughs> they they might be bit. the most famous people from Maine. <laughs> It's the best flex ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next, that's our next outing. When Emma and I meet up, we're going to go meet the creator of Doug. Um, that, that'd be super, super cool. Do you even have a clue what we're talking about, Emma? Did you ever watch like classic Nickelodeon shows? No, the only ones I know what you're talking about are you know, Patrick Starr from SpongeBob and the Fairly Godparents from Fairly Odd Parents. Other than that, no clue. <laughs> I had a friend in high school who had a reptar tattoo on his shoulder. <laughs> That's which, awesome. like, now that I say it, maybe it's because it's late and I've had a long week, but kind of sounds like a good idea. Anyway, <laughs> uh, is it a good idea? Let me know in the chat. I want to see what people's picks are. I've got some great picks here. Nigel Thornberry from our buddy OK Indar. Um, <laughs> Wes likes that reptar reference. Um, he says, I suppose this game, Jacob says, I suppose this game would fit the classic, as would fit the aesthetic of Legends Look Back. Very true, very true. Uh, Doug, Doug is another <laughs> another good pick that uh, Wes is liking there. Here's the confirmed list of characters so far, and this just sounds like a ton of fun. I don't know if I'm the biggest fighting game fan, but it just sounds like I've got that 90s nostalgia, you know? We got Helga from Hey Arnold. <laughs> Danny Phantom from Danny Phantom. All right, I can't keep saying that every time. Sandy Cheeks from SpongeBob SquarePants. Now, who is that, Freddie? Is she the squirrel with the astronaut helmet? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would pick her for sure. She's like a karate master, so. Okay, karate, right. Karate, Absolutely. Yes. So uh, we got Zim from Invader Zim, Nigel Thornberry, Michelangelo from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Cowabunga Dude. Um, we got Leonardo, SpongeBob himself, Patrick Star, Reptar, Lincoln Loud from the Loud House? I don't even know what that is. All right. <laughs> and Oblina from Ario Monsters, which I forgot existed. Oh, man. <laughs> and then Powdered Toast Man from Rin and Stimpy. So surely there'll be more coming your way. Uh, what, what do you think would be like a classic Legends character that would fit in along these Nickelodeon? Uh, maybe Luuk <laughs> the Thrawn yeah. trilogy? Yeah, you could do Luuk. C-3PX? Yeah, I just is that what you said? I don't know. I don't know why I said that. Well, actually, I do. Last night on the Cosmic Force, C three PX was our community art of the week, and I was like, you know what? He'd be great in a fighting game. 
<laughs> so would like triple uh, zero, BT one, like all those murder droids. They yeah, but at least great. you went classic with your pick. At least you went right. classic. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Oh my goodness. You know what else is good? This episode of Legends Look Back. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. This is, of course, proudly part of the Utini Podcast Network. It's a Star Wars books podcast for people who only play video games on consoles that come in the color Atomic Purple, where we talk about all things Star Wars Legends, celebrating our rich EU history, as well as diving into lesser known Star Wars classics. I'm your host, Jared Mays, and I'm joined tonight from the monsoon, Freddie C. What's up, Freddie? I'm doing all right. I'm alive. I have. I actually found my uh, what is it? Atomic purple game gear. No, not game gear. Game Boy game color. Boy? Yeah. Nice. So uh, I'm playing. Uh, <laughs> I've got it at right now. The Sims. I'm not sure if you ever played The Sims on that thing, but it was interesting. It was like a GTA style. Oh, game. Cool. Yeah, it was really really odd. I'd anyway, like that's what see, I'm doing. <laughs> like to see Corey build a mansion on an atomic purple. Um, Sims Game Boy <laughs> be a ton of fun, ton of fun. Well, we are joined again tonight, uh, once again filling in for us. Here is our producer in the month of July and doing a stellar job. Who last night discussed the old school Legends Marvel comics without us? Emma Park, how are you, Emma? Hello, guys. Um, doing well. Um, yeah, we talked some Legends comics last night. Um, Trev was our, our special guest. He pre-recorded some stuff for us. Yeah, and, I saw that. Uh, he he was talking about the who jibs, and I was like, <laughs> "What is he even talking about?" <laughs> when I turned on the show right after I finished teaching my Wednesday night class, I I always turn it on on the way out of the church building. Like before I even hit the car, I'm like, "Ooh, cosmic force, cosmic force!" And my wife's like, "Don't watch YouTube while you drive." And I'm like, "All right, fine." But, <laughs> and I just heard them say who jibs, and I was like, oh, "Legends," <laughs> and this was like the perfect moment the own the first word i heard come out of y'all's mouth was who jibs and i was like jared has arrived it was just perfect time i can't wait to catch up on that it's crazy (laughs) can't wait to catch up on that i freddie and i have famously never read the entirety of that series we both yeah just chunks uh it's it's like tough to make it through all of it (laughs) yeah i can definitely see why there's definitely i mean when you compare them to like uh you know current day comics there's just a ton of speech bubbles per page and it takes a while to get through an issue it does it's an investment but uh you know what better time to invest in some legends in between your canon releases and uh, kind of reaching that summer late summer lull uh, after this big wave of high republic stuff so maybe maybe now be a good time for that looking forward to at least getting caught up on some of my who jibs lore i can't, gotta, <laughs> gotta be caught up on that for sure well i was really enjoying it looking forward to finishing that episode tomorrow uh not joining us tonight who of course has been with us for the long haul here on legends look back we do want to give a shout out for her birthday is uh, our friend meg dowell meg just had a birthday yesterday want to give her special birthday birthday shout out uh, is taking a sabbatical here in the month of july i just want to say to everybody first of all happy birthday to meg congratulations on all your new funko pops and black series <laughs> i can fly for sure can wait to see those on the future installment of what do we call that segment uh Dragon's Dragon thrift, thrift store. store yeah yeah she hates that um <laughs> <laughs> but uh, i do want to say of course everybody please go use the force on a big cup of noodles in her honor so happy birthday yes, meg happy we're birthday, not going meg. to do yeah, have, we're not going to do Legends Lookout tonight. No Thracken's Thrift Store. However, we do have some stuff. I've got some I got some releases right over here. But we're going to get straight into the meat of the show. We're going to save some of the, uh, the periphery for next time around because this is one of our very special book roundtable discussion episodes. We are talking about the Legends Essential Collection itself. I've got mine, actually, to show off tonight, and that is Shatterpoint by... Matthew Stover. We're going to be getting into the overarching questions. Last week, of course, we talked about the characters. We talked about uh, Mace Windu. Uh, You know, the book is kind of about him. We had to talk about him at least a little bit. Um, We, of course, talked about maybe the scariest villain. Jury was out on this. Maybe the scariest villain to only ever appear in a single Star Wars story in Car Vaster. We talked about what on earth was happening with Depa Balaba. A little bit of Dooku, a little bit of Palpatine um, along the way in there as well. But tonight we are getting into kind of the big picture stuff. First and foremost, the name of this book is Shatterpoint. Uh, First of all, as a concept, is a Shatterpoint in the Force, like being able to detect 
a, a weakness, some kind of a, a fault line in the force. Is this the coolest original concept that an author ever originated in the EU, Freddie? I think so. It's it's such an interesting concept that you would see fractures, uh, you know, dependent on on whatever situation it is, whether it be the the tide of the war or, you know, I, I I'm not sure exactly how it works, but just seeing a shatter point and understanding that that's that right there that you're looking at, whatever you did to it, if it was destruction or pressing a button, could change the outcome of, you know, kind of like the butterfly effect, I guess. Yeah, man, yeah, butterfly effect. Hadn't thought about that. Um, what was cool for me was that not only could he detect like a person's weakness, right? Uh, and he does this later in the book with spoiler alert, by the way, we're going to get into full spoiler territory as we talk about Shatterpoint. No holds barred. Uh, you've been warned. The book has been out since 2003. So, I mean, like, we just now got an audiobook. There's no excuse, but hey, we're going to give you a chance. All right. This is your chance to get out of the jungle. Get uh, out of here. Call. That's right. <laughs> uh, you want to read this one for sure. Definitely want to read it, or at least, you know, the audiobook. Um, the cool thing for me, all right, that was your warning, with the shatter points is not only can you detect a weakness in somebody's battle strategy, right? So this comes up in the battle against Car Vaster in the third act where Mace detects a weakness in his sh spinning shields that he mm. uses, right? And there's a way that he can kind of get in there in between them or behind them or there was something with the shields do you remember freddy no i don't remember exactly what it was <laughs> no. i just yeah, yeah. know that he found the weakness <laughs> right but the cool thing for me is that it's bigger than that right he can actually see and detect to a certain extent as with his limited uh, perceptions of cosmic events he could detect the fact that there were fault lines in the force itself right that in the galactic conflict of the clone wars there were shatter points um in particular he makes the assessment that dooku is the shatter point of the clone wars we talked about that a little bit last week whether or not we thought that was true if you take out dooku would that have ended the clone wars but i want to go a step further than that freddie and that is what do you think is the shatter point of the book shatter point i as i was reading the book thought of at least a dozen different possibilities. It's like the greatest double entendre of a title there's ever been. That's interesting. I, I'm curious to see what you found on it because I feel like the shatter point, you're right. There's so many different shatter points. There's like the shatter point of the Jedi because of the war, the looming war that's coming. Right. And the Jedi's perception of the force has been darkened. Exactly. By war. Right. Exactly. And so that's, there's one. Sure. Uh, I also thought about just the shatter point of, I mean, there's just so many different ways you can think about it, but but the relationship between the separatists and the Republic, I mean, it was it was turning sour. I could I would say at this point, but I would say there was there was almost no going back. Um, so maybe sure. this yeah. this war had some impact on that, but yeah, I'm curious to see what <laughs> I feel like you can think of a million different types of things. Shatterpoint of of that planet, right, and uh, and and the people, right? Yeah, on you can it. think on on the smaller scale for the conflict on Harun Call. What is the shatterpoint of that conflict? And even there, there's still like five or six answers. <laughs> yeah. What is the shatterpoint? Is it Mace's ability to carry out the task and and get the job done and win the war? Is it Depa? Is she the shatterpoint if she's going to go with Car or if she's going to go with Mace, the light or the dark side? Is it Car Vaster? In is he going to live up to the legacy of being a good Windu, or is he going to be this jungle savage who is more animal than man? Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot, Freddie. You got you got Gepton, the, the yeah, oh, yeah, the, the separatist. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of different options. You have Yaddle. A, oh, Yaddle? <laughs> <laughs> Was she in this? No, Yaddle's a shatter point. <laughs> She's a shatter point all to herself. Yeah, that's right, all to her Yaddle self. Uh, do you have an opinion on this before I weigh in on a couple a couple more options, Emma? What is the shatter point in shatter point? Yeah, so I honestly, this might sound weird at first, but I think it's the jungle itself. Like, because I was looking at this question more as, like, in terms of the plot of this book instead of the Clone Wars as a whole. Um, and so, you know, there's, like, the darkness of the jungle. Uh, you know, it, it turns people sort of mad with, like, you know, sort of dark energy. Um 
you know, Carvaster might be an easy answer in this, but at the same time, you know, there were other adversaries like, you know, Colonel Gepton, like you said. Um, and I honestly think that, like, if you if you look at the jungle as a shatter point and you take that piece out of it, then, you know, you might be able to reason with, with more people and, and be able to sort of end the conflict, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Sure. Yeah. The the jungle place. It's like it's its own character in this, which is yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. cool. Uh, here's one shatter point we've not mentioned yet, and that's Nick Rostu as a character he is a shatter point all to himself. Of course, comes in as the character who is kind of the jokester among the crew of Coronai, and yet he's more than that. Mace sees the potential in him. Eventually, uh, enlists him as uh, what a, a a colonel, a captain. Something like that, yeah. His personal aid in the Republic battle. So he flips, and that doesn't make Carvaster very happy, of course. And then, of course, later in the book, Nick, what does he do? He shoot uh, the blaster out of, the lightsaber out of uh, Depp's hand? Is that right? Uh, basically, the, the big turning point in two major battles in the book, one against Carvaster and two against Deppa, hmm. um, he ends up being the one who is the, the pivotal person who turns the tide of, of these battles where basically um, Mace is about to be killed in one instance by Carbaster and in the other um, is Depp is about to take her own life and he inca incapacitates her ability to do that uh, and in a lot of ways I thought that um, that Nick is the shatter point of course uh, saw in some other ways that maybe um, maybe there are some other possibilities the cool thing about the way that stover writes is that he does try to leave things ambiguous don't you think freddie i think so i think so and, and i like that because that you know a lot of people want explanation on on certain things right with star wars why is this this way why is it that way but i mean if you really think about it george lucas there <laughs> imagine going into the story and and there's all these characters already everything's already named everything's assumed even though it's really not assumed and and you know, ambiguity is power to the story because it just makes it that much more mysterious. I think that's true. I think that's true. And the cool thing is Stover uh, recently on Twitter is he's gotten more in, engaged and involved with the fans on social media. They'll ask him some of these clarifying questions and he'll say, I'm not going to do it. I don't want to give you my interpretation. Sometimes I do it and I can't help myself, but as much as possible, I would like to refrain from giving you my authoritative interpretation and leave it up to you and let you have some agency in how you interpret all of this. Now, hear me out. I've got one more possibility for you, Freddie. This book is written before the release of Revenge of the Sith. Mm -hmm. What is Mace's role in Revenge of the Sith? Well, that's the thing. He's, he's trying to stop Palpatine, which obviously he fails at. I mean, that's, that's like the whole... That yeah. was what he was supposed to do, right? That that was his his whole thing. He got all the way to the precipice of the lightsaber at uh, still robed Palp's uh, throat <laughs> at this particular point in time. He gets all the way there, but he he failed to totally take Anakin out of the picture. Yeah. He has this confrontation with Anakin. He's like, "Stay here, don't do the thing." And Anakin's like, "But I want to." And you know, uh, he yeah. does. He comes and ruins everything. Uh, he's too dangerous to be kept alive. Well, in some ways, I think that Mace is the shatter point of the Clone Wars. Uh, he is the one who's going to have the best chance physically of taking out Palpatine. All you know, Kit Fisto, who are the other Jedi in the office that just get decimated in seconds? Gosh, I don't he even remember. A chance. It was, yeah, it was seconds. Sassy Chin, is he in there? I mean, it's a, it's a very poor performance by those other <laughs> yeah. Four Jedi, bless their hearts. F's in the chat for the Jedi in Palpatine's office. Mace is the one who stands the best chance, and I think that's because he gets woke. From from my Legends perspective, he gets woke in this uh, the Harun Call fiasco. He sees that there's more to the war than meets the eye. I think he's able to pinpoint the fact that um, that there's more to this than just Dooku being an enthusiastic separatist who's charismatic in order to get people to join his side. Um, anyway, there's a lot of different levels for that, and it can really break your brain if you think about it too hard. And uh, if you dra drag on to it, hold on to us while uh, you're going into the deep end on this question, 
we could all drown. So we don't want that. Grab your life preservers, of course. Um, do want to say do want to say that we're interested in your interpretations of this. Uh, what do you think is the shatter point in the book? Shatter point. We'd love to hear your takes on that. All right. So Freddie, you looked it up. Did you look it up there, Freddie? Agent Kolar, Sassy Tin, Kit Fisto. Yep, that was them. Um... Just there's only four. I feel like we're supposed to have five, right? Uh, does it matter though? It's the, it's the B team. <laughs> It's the B team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. In, in some ways, Anakin is the shatter point, right? Um, he's barely in this book, but he's referenced. Like Mace does believe in the prophecy. but He does, but he's Anakin, hesitant. Yeah, keeps Anakin at arm's length. Sure. Now, one of the things we talked about is the failing of the Jedi, how, in some ways, the Jedi, due to the nature of warfare, just how, how bloody and brutal it is, um, how much loss of life there is, how the lines are blurred between right and wrong, dark and light. Even the Jedi become generals in the war. Uh, it's very early in the book we get this reference to the fact that a shadow has fallen over the Force. The book ends up saying a little bit later that it happens right before the Battle of Naboo. Now, speculate with me. Let's turn it over to Emma first. Emma, what in the world do you think caused, at least from this legend's perspective, what do you think caused the shadow to fall over the Force? What is it that's clouding the Jedi's perception? I think I'm going to take the easy answer and say Palpatine, but here's why. So if, according to this book, the shadow uh, over the Force happened right before the Battle of Naboo, let's think about who really orchestrated the Battle of Naboo. It was Palpatine. Who really orchestrated the Clone Wars? It was Palpatine. Kind of botched um, the Battle of Naboo, though, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did. He did. But like, but it accomplished his end goal, which was to become Chancellor of the Republic uh, by using Queen Amidala as, as a pawn. Um, and, you know, I'll just give a little shout out to my, my Marvel friends. It was Palpatine all along. Wait, what's that quoting? Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, right. Sure, Agnes. Oh. <laughs> nice. I didn't want to sing for you guys. You don't want to hear that. <laughs> All right. She took the, <laughs> yeah. um, she took the, the easy way out. Freddie, what's your what's your take? So what I try to think of is, uh, and I've been trying to formulate what kind of things could cloud the force, right? The the light side of the force, and that is darkness. And it's it's a very solid answer. But what what kinds of things go into the darkness, right? What kind of feelings? There's there's stress, there's fear, there's hate, suffering. So if you just create a lot of the of that feeling across the entire galaxy, yeah, the dark side is just going to absolutely prevail against any darkness. So in my opinion, I think the fact that so much discord was sown throughout so many different planets, oh, it no, just became stuff. Yeah, yeah. It just became overbearing. So that's just that's my that's my take. That's great, Freddie. All right, so my answer was going to be war. You said, I like the way you said it. Would you say Discord? Yeah, not the not the app. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was the buy sell trade uh, channel. That's the one that really is what ruined the Jedi's perception <laughs> of the Force. Um, no, no, I I think that I think that's a good point. Definitely that because Palpatine doesn't have a Force power to cast a shadow over the Force. There's more to it than that, right? I mean, yeah, that's true. I mean, what is that like? Super super dark battle meditation nice try palpatine we know that only jedi can do battle meditation um the best of all the force powers where you sit and think hard that's right um <laughs> now i want to take it to the next level though when it comes to the shadow over the force and i wonder this one kind of got me do you think the jedi were liable for not reporting it to the senate as mm. soon as they discovered that's what that's what was up Hey, by the way, guys, your peacekeepers, we're going to be snoozing for like the next 10 years, maybe-ish. Something's wrong with our ability to be able to tap into this mystical energy field that allows us to do our job well. Just just going to let you know, like, we're not doing great at that right now, and we don't know why. I, I feel like maybe it's modern politics getting in, in the way um, in terms of I want more honesty and authenticity and transparency in my government. Uh, but I wonder, <laughs> should the Jedi have kind of like disclosed this? Of course. Yeah. They, yeah of course, I feel like yeah. that, that transparency would have, I mean, transparency uh, 
sows trust, right? They they were I feel like they were fearing micro fearing, right? They oh we don't believe in fear, but of course they they had some fear. What wait a minute, this is different. Uh, and they never they never admitted it to anybody and never it never gained the the trust that they needed to build the things that create the light side, right? So justice, whatever, you know, everything else that they they go for. I'm I'm angry at the Jedi because of all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you there. I mean, you know, in a way, I guess you could you could say to your point, Freddie, like the Jedi kind of fear being afraid. Yeah. And mm. and I also think that there is an element of them not wanting to like admit weakness in a way, like like okay, we're about to become uh, a, a weakened body, like much more weakened than we were right. previously, but you know, this might cause some panic, so maybe we should just keep this on the down low. Because, you know, we know for a fact that multiple Jedi, pretty much every Jedi who had any inkling of the Force could tell that something was wrong. And they just didn't want to share it with any non-Jedi. And, yeah, I think, of course, they were absolutely wrong to do that and could easily take some blame in all the issues that occurred afterwards. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that we're getting some great points made in the chat, specifically from Jacob, that um, this time's up well. He said Tenebris. I think he means Plagueis. Yeah, he says Plagueis there in his correction. Uh, the 10-year pr- prior to well, – this is pretty early in the Clone Wars. 10 years prior to Shatterpoint, the death of Plagueis then, kind of from a Legends perspective, kind of becomes – when the force gets clouded sure that would make sense that would make sense uh be nasty says that the jedi i can't even say his name (laughs) which we're so used to saying it now be nasty says that uh the jedi clouded themselves by allowing more violent tendencies to influence them palpatine put them in that position but they did it to themselves so uh that's very cool very cool um, they became too complacent in protecting that they forgot what they were protecting. Definitely uh, agree yeah, on all this. Point. I couldn't help but in reading this feel like maybe there was an appropriate time to go ahead and swallow the pride and admit, you know, right there on the Senate floor, getting one of those cool hover chairs and float right on out into the center and say, hey, guys, <laughs> by the way, just got to let you know. All right. See you later. Um, I do like that in the end of the book, they accidentally leak it to Palpatine, not knowing that, you know, he's a Sith Lord and... <laughs> He's like, oh, wait, what? Your ability to perceive the force is clouded? Oh, like pretending like that's he's not excited. He's he's like, oh, I guess that kind of stinks. I'm sorry. Condolences. F's in the chat. <laughs> Yo, that's hype. <laughs> um, so he's he's pretty excited about that. Um, now, let's we, we've gotten into some pretty deep, dark, heavy territory. Let's lighten it up for a second, Freddie. There's one word that appears in this book an alarming number of times. <laughs> I'm not talking about the word war. I'm not talking about the word uh, act dog. What do you think this word is, Freddie, that uh, we're going to have to talk about here for a second on Legends Look Back? Well, I wouldn't have guessed it until I looked at the the show notes. And it kind of surprises me because I didn't realize that it said, I said that word that many times. <laughs> I'm, I, I feel like we should just have some guesses in the chat of, of what exactly this word could There's be. There's a keyword that we... <laughs> have happened to trace throughout legends history when <laughs> characters find themselves in compromising positions specifically we had uh, vader in this position in shadows of the empire Shizor is also you know doing this we've got uh all right do we have it yet in the chat has anybody said it the word is naked all right we've got <laughs> i don't even know if they'll let you type that in youtube comments keep it clean y'all keep it clean here's the deal you know just just flirt with the line a little bit don't go way too far all right how many times, Emma, I'm going to let you guess, do you think the word naked appears between pages 40 and 50? Okay, so we've got 10 pages here. I remember, by the way, when I first read the section, I um, had to close the book for a second and walk away because I was like, <laughs> this cannot be happening again. This cannot be happening yeah. again. Like every time you guys have me read a Legends book, right? Like you have me read <laughs> Shadows of the Empire. That's true. That's true. And then now I'm reading Shatterpoint every time. But uh, so I'm going to guess between those 10 pages, I'm going to guess that the word naked was said a dozen times. Okay. Uh, Freddie, your guess. Yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna lowball it and just go with a nine. We'll see. Nine. All <laughs> right. right. Now, here's rules. the thing. It feels like more times than it actually is. 
because they do say it a few times in quick succession. Uh, don't believe me? We've got an we've got an excerpt. Okay. Now here's the numbers. Here's the numbers. The book only has the word appearing seven times overall, four times between pages thirty nine and fifty. But it feels like a lot because yeah. there is so much naked mace kicking so much <laughs> naked butt. All right. It's seven times too many. I think we can all agree. <laughs> all right. Here we go. This is this is the, the, the excerpt. Are you ready for this? <clears throat> Put myself into my best Sullivan, jo- Sullivan Jones voice. The blockhouse had a smell all its own, a dark, musky funk, rich and organic. The showers themselves were simple auto nozzles. <laughs> Spraying bacterium-rich nutrient mist, they lined the walls of a thirsty, nope. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) Of a 30-meter (laughs) walkthrough. I said thirsty. (laughs) Let's try this again. (sighs) It's getting hot in here. I'm sweating. Mace (laughs) stripped off his clothes and stuffed them into his kit bag. There was a conveyor strip for possessions beside the walkthrough entrance, but he held on to the bag. A few germs wouldn't do it any harm. At the far end of the showers, he walked into a situation. The dressing station was loud with turbine-driven air jet dryers. The two Kubas and the comedy team, still naked, milled uncertainly in one corner. A large, surly-looking human in sun-bleached khakis and a military cap stood facing them, impressive arms folded across his equally impressive chest. <laughs> uh, had to. All right. He stared at the naked travelers with cold, unspecific threat. Man, it's just amazing. It's just amazing. Isn't that a great, uh, great excerpt there? There's more. Uh, he busts them in the nose. Uh, there's another. All right. Let's skip it into the next page. Page forty. Um, they say this. He's a funny one. The smaller man spun his stun baton and stepped toward him. He's not just smart. He's funny. The big man moved to his flank. Yeah, regular comedian. Comedians are over there. Mason inclined his head toward Faux Finian and his Katonak partner, naked and shivering in the corner. See the difference? Anyway, so uh, it's just amazing. Is <laughs> he like, that yeah, a what are you seeing in this yeah. book? Well, everyone is naked. Everyone yeah. is naked, and they're fighting in the shower. That is yeah, the, bizarre. The, the, the probiotics <laughs> shower. <laughs> I picture it as like a yogurt shower. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Strawberry yogurt. Yogurt mace. Oh my goodness. So yeah, he's like, what are you supposed to be then? I'm a prophet. I can see the future. And then he, you know, busts them up. It's That's just a amazing. pretty good line, I have to admit. It is. There's so many good one-liners. Maybe the best Star Wars book for one-liners. Oh, totally. I'm saying it. 100%. Mic drop. Boom. There yeah. it is. I'll agree with you. Yeah. Excellent. Good. All right. While well, we're talking about the excellence of this book, let me ask you this. Matthew Stover, obviously a legendary Legends author. Depending on if you count Revenge of the Sith as Legends or canon, we count it as Legends for sure. We claim it on our side of the line, largely because of how much it references Mace's backstory in Shatterpoint, how much of the lore from this this strand that he's built up makes its way over into, into that novelization. Freddie, I've got a hypothesis here. Are you ready for this? Here's my hot take for tonight. I think... Stover has written three of the top 10 best Star Wars books ever written. Do you know <sighs> what they are and do you agree? I I I think I might agree on 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 at least so Revenge of the Sith novelization was amazing and it's in my top 10 for sure. Shatterpoint is also in my top. I'm not sure what what list it's in but it's in my top list of recommendations. Uh, although I can't, <laughs> I'm not sure about Shadows of Mindor. Okay, I've not read that one yet. That's like in one of my last 10 or 12 Legends books that I've never read. Um, I'm hanging on to it because I know it's written by it's written by a legendary author. It's a standalone. I left a lot of the standalones for last because you can squeeze them in at weird points in your life when you need one random Star Wars book. I've also left it because I know it deals a little bit with the origins of Rogue Squadron, one of my favorite topics, so I've tried to save it. So, Mentor on the Outskirts. A Mentor on the Outskirts. Um, you named two. I don't think you've named my third. Did you? I think I it was... Uh, isn't, didn't you write a new a, a new Jedi Order book? Yeah, Traitor. Uh, Traitor, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people view that as the best new Jedi Order book. 
which I might agree with. It's certainly the trippiest. <laughs> I'll give it that. It's very existential. Um, uh, Emma, you've read Revenge of the Sith, right? Have you read Traitor? I have not read Traitor. I have read Revenge of the Sith. The hype is real. Like, uh, you know, mm-hmm. if you haven't read it yet, what are you doing? Go read it. <laughs> yeah, get yeah. out of here. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. And, you know, his writing, he's a very good writer. You know, I'll give him that. Um, I haven't read enough Legends books to say if he's written the uh, the top three or three of the top ten Legends yeah. books. So I'm going to defer my opinion on that. But, you know, we've got two solid books here that I've read from him. So it's good stuff. Okay, you could, you could see it being a possibility though, right? I could see it. Sure. Here's the thing. In order to get to Traitor, you first need to read the entire Thrawn trilogy, the entire new Jedi. No, uh, young... Dang it, Freddie, what are those called? The Jedi Academy. Yeah, books. Jedi Academy. The ones I read under the concussion. <laughs> oh, that's uh, right. The Jedi Academy books. Should probably read the entire X Wing series, mm-hmm. I Jedi, the Thrawn duology, the Corellian trilogy, if you're feeling ambitious, the first six young Jedi Knights, then you're ready to start the new Jedi Order, wow. which will get you into Vector Prime, and then the first two Michael Stackpole books. After that, you've got a couple Lucinos to get through. Um, after that, what we've got Balance Point, Star by Star. So yeah, it, it's like the eighth book in that series. So <laughs> I mean, out of all of those books, I think um, I Jedi has to be the deal breaker of this, right? <laughs> <laughs> It's the least necessary <laughs> of all of those, yeah. but there's so much Utini lore with it at this point. Right, you you just got to read it. At, I've got to read it at some point, just because like you know, there's been so many jokes made. I just I need to know. <laughs> yeah, I reread it uh, right about the time that Corey did because I had just read the um, Jedi Academy trilogy in January, and I was like, this. I'm pretty sure that. I Jedi retcons a lot of it and was trying to do a good job for our roundtables on the Jedi Academy trilogy. So I read it. I took one for the team and I reread <laughs> I Jedi. Uh, you said the hype is real a minute ago. I'll say this much. You know, I think I agree with I Jedi. Maybe you know, one of the more, we'll call it the more infamous or notorious Legends books. Go. Yeah, we won't use the W word here. We won't use that one, but um, <laughs> we'll say it's something. Yeah, okay, Indar says, Young Jedi Knights? Yeah, I would say that the first six are a really good prerequisite for New Jedi Order. You don't necessarily re- need to read all 13 for enjoyment of the New Jedi Order, but the first six forms a cohesive story. It'll take you, you know, uh, two hours a piece. Could take you a week if you read for two hours a day. So, so not a huge investment. But uh, definitely good for getting a primer on Jason and Jaina before it gets dark and then the aliens drop moons on people and all that, right? Uh, definitely a good primer. Have you read that whole series, Freddie? I have not read it yet. I, I, it's on my list. There's a lot, there's a lot going on, and I kind of want to dig into canon just a tiny bit. But yeah, it's it's on my list for sure. Got to get caught up on your High Republic, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do too. I'm behind right now. I'm, like this is the farthest behind I've ever been on canon since canon became canon, and you know at least I'm caught up on my legend. At least I'm caught up, um, at least for this show, right? So uh, jury's out on that. We'll have to catch up with Emma in like five years when she's gotten that far into the new Jedi Order, and uh, if if she thinks Traitor holds up, uh, definitely definitely think that it does. It's been maybe ten years for me. It's about time for a reread on. Some of those classics as well. Now, we've talked about some lighthearted stuff. I want to dip our toes back into the deep end one more time uh, before we dip out of this thing, Freddie. Now, overall, this book is, yes, it's a Star Wars book. But I couldn't help but think at certain points that this is more of a Vietnam War book than it is a Star Wars book. Did you get that vibe at time at times, Freddie? Yeah, I really did. I think, I think even... I'm not 100% sure, but I feel like Matthew Stover might have been influenced by Apocalypse Now and a couple other Vietnam references. And, and you can feel it, just the, the, you know, the weather that they're going through, which is pretty humid and, and very hot. And then, of course, all of the mosquitoes and the, the bugs. bugs. Yeah, exactly. And it just feels so jungly. And, and then the guerrilla warfare, right? Uh, and... and you know, the colonizers, I guess, trying to come in to 
take over the forest for their own production and 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 they you know they're they're just not into it and i it just feels very very vietnam uh vietnam era there were some times where i thought it was a little heavy-handed in that regard what do you think yeah yeah i I could certainly see that i mean for me it was hard like so last semester in college i took a class about genocide uh oh yeah great yeah it's like sign up for that as an elective just like uh (laughs) genocide 101 yeah, it's definitely um, not the most cheery of classes, for sure, but it it's filled tough. an elective. Uh, Gotta have so a coffee it, before that. So it worked. But, um, you know, we read uh, Heart of Darkness and a few other books about um, genocide. And so okay. for me, it was, like, really hard to sort of, like, read Shatterpoint and not think about all of the connections. So in that way, like, it did seem heavy-handed, but I wasn't sure if that was just me because, you know, I had just read all these books about genocide and colonialism um, and sort of, you know, making another group of people like the other and feeling, you know, making them out to be savages and things like that. So um, I think I saw on Wikipedia that um, Matthew Stover took inspiration from Heart of Darkness yeah, I've seen that too. Things. I'm not sure where I saw that. Yeah, um, so you know that was cool for me because I could, I could honestly, you know, in Heart of Darkness, like they uh, this group of um, colonizers like travel up river, and it felt very much like that in Shatterpoint, like they're traveling through the jungle to get to mm-hmm. a destination. Same thing in Heart of Darkness, having to go through um, sort of like some violent natives, but not trying to um, get to know them or or uh, or see another side. Um, so you know, was it heavy handed yeah. at times? Maybe, but you know, I think I think it's good to have some real world connections in Star Wars. It helps us see um, our real world issues in a different right. light, and I think that's I, I think that's a good thing. I appreciate that he wasn't afraid to dive right into some really tough topics and maybe one of the more poignant Star Wars books in terms of really making a point. And there were at times, though, where I wondered what exactly is the point that he's trying to make, specifically with colonialism. Um, Freddie, did you have a take on this? What exactly was his point? Was it it right for uh, Mace to come and get involved in this, uh, for the Jedi to ever get involved? Was... Um, or the the separatists and the the mercenaries, you know, the the colonizers in this particular instance. Uh, what do you think was his main point concerning the the evils of colonialism? You know, just for some light Thursday night conversation here. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's a tough one because this dark this book is a dark book. Everything in it is just there's there's nothing that's really that funny, right? It, it, the 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 comedic points. I think are, are to kind of take you away from all the negativity that's happening in the book. Yeah. Thank God for Nick Ross too. Am I right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> seriously. And even then you could hear the doubt in his voice when he was being funny. Right. He's just like, right, right guys. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's really tough for me to really understand if it was good for the Jedi to, to intervene because look at the outcome. I mean, they had to take away eventually, uh, vaster right and and who else is going to tame the people in the jungle it's just it's really hard to tell honestly whether it was a good or bad thing and it just seems like it was an all-around i probably just wouldn't get involved kind of thing right just like lose lose scenario it's completely a lose lose scenario and and there's really just like just like the war right the vietnamese war it just seemed like it wasn't gonna go anywhere one of the big buzzwords in this book that he kept coming back to was the word civilization um, that's that being civilized was kind of the the be all end all, right? That that civilization is what the republic is fighting for to be civilized, right? To live above this you know jungle lifestyle, and at times that didn't sit great with me. That civilization was what the the war was about was the fight for civilization, and that to become uncivilized was the enemy as if living in the jungle is any more inherently is inherently worse than living living in Cor- on Coruscant right um 
do you think that that he was kind of being tongue in cheek with that, or would you think he was being genuine in terms of saying that uh, that civilization is the heart of society? Well, so this is very interesting, just coming from my perspective from that class that I just took on genocide. Yeah. Like, like the the term civilization was used a lot in that class because that was the reason that many genocides occurred. Like, especially if you look at cases in, you know, okay anywhere in Africa, basically, um, you know, Europeans would say, well, they're uncivilized and they have to yeah. learn our ways to become civilized. Right. And then a genocide would happen because they take away their culture. They kill people that won't cooperate, things like that. And so it made me think like, are the Jedi committing genocides in these places where or i guess the it republic gets, as a whole it gets messy it definitely does it does yeah. it does like are they are they doing it here on harun call are they doing it other places inadvertently are the separatists doing the same thing like is there anything is there any sort of middle ground that anybody can find like it brought up a lot of questions to me because you know both sides could be doing it or or you could just let it go and have these civil wars happening and then you could have outsiders say, well, the Republic's not doing anything to stop it. But at the same time, you know, it certainly could be considered genocide, I think. Uh, you know, you want to wipe out the the culture of a people to make them more civilized when the definition of civilized isn't the same for everyone. Wow. Uh, Emma's carrying the show tonight, Freddie. I, um, this, is, this is a tough topic. I this is a book. This whole book could just be characterized by that Eddie Murphy meme where he looks at the camera and does this. You know, where he says, like, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. a real thinker, isn't it? Yeah. It's yeah. one of the things that, that I appreciate about Car Vaster's character is it, at times it looks like Mace is going to reach him and, and bring him over into civilization and make him more of a Jedi. And he's going to play by the rules. And then there's, a, there's other times where it looks like Vaster is going to take. Depa over to this other side and keep her there in terms of war is all there is and you live for the jungle and you tame the jungle and uh, you're never going to get me to put a shirt on sort of <laughs> this is my way of making fun of it but eventually the book culminates with this whole theme of civilization and Mace's great fear right this vision which I think was the coolest thing in the whole book I was like whatever I was doing at the time I'd have been out running I just stopped and was like oh because it was so cool. Do um, you remember this? His dream, Freddy? He sees... Yeah, the... this is the one with Coruscant, right? Uh, yeah, the he... Coruscant covered in jungle. Covered in jungle. Uh, I'm trying to remember it now. I can't remember exactly what happened, but it, it's a pretty stunning, stunning scene if you really think about it. So somebody on Twitter asked him, is this specifically um, for, foretelling, forecasting the... Uh, what ha what happens to Coruscant in the New Jedi Order, right? Mm. In the Yuuzhan Vong War, where Coruscant, sp mild spoiler for that series, gets taken over by the Yuuzhan Vong and then terraformed. And so they turn it into a bio planet, this planet that was all the beacon of civilization, a citywide planet. They turn into a living fluorescent jungle, right? Uh, and then Jason infiltrates, and there's a world brain, and a Ganner, it's a whole thing, right? But, uh, <laughs> of course, he was asked to weigh in on this, and he was like, yeah, I'm not going to. Uh, deal with it. No, no, no. He's like, I just don't think it's the way to do it. I don't think that that's right for me as an author to give you my be-all, end-all interpretation. Freddie, do you think this is primarily about the issue of civilization and colonialism or is it primarily him trying to sneak a new jedi order easter egg in there this is interesting i i i perceived it a little differently i perceived it as the 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 technically the jungle is the darkness right that's where that's where the fear the the survival kind of kicks in and i felt like that jungle was basically palpatine infiltrating civilization if that makes sense and getting his his dark tentacles over over the entire I mean, Imperial Center, right? But that's that's another one, right? That's it's ambiguous. It's it's room for interpretation, and that's that's the best part. Cool. Yeah. Nice. Uh, what about you, Emma? Do you think this is more of an Easter egg or more of a, a capital L literature point that he's driving home? Yeah. So I've kind of changed my mind on this since the last like fifteen minutes of our conversation. 
I do think that it's another reference to civilization and colonialism. Um, and the way that I'm thinking about it is, you know, let's say that they, uh, that Carvaster uh, and the darkness, basically, on Harun Kal takes over and wins. What would happen if they went and civilized, quote unquote, Coruscant? Mm-hmm. Because their definition of civilization is what they're doing right now in Harun Call. So it, their definition is different than what the Jedi and probably the citizens of Coruscant yeah. would would call it. And so what would happen if Mace and Depa failed and Carvaster and, and the other uh, his, his other cronies on Harun Call, what if they took over and then spread their roots with colonialism onto Coruscant and sort of turned it into another sort of Harun Call type situation. Well, that just blew my mind. <laughs> I, uh, I'm going to have to bury myself under the covers now and think about that one. <laughs> it's just <laughs> totally, t- totally blew my mind. It's like, yeah, well, what if any other civilization tries to yeah. force its way of life upon us? Um, and we, because we all know the correct answer, which is America, right? America. No, 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 no. Maybe not. Maybe not. Um, <laughs> now. As uh, I was, I was, I was trained as a missionary, so I took uh, missions classes in college. We talked about the concept of cultural relativism, which is that you judge a, a civilization, you judge a culture based on the merits of um, of its own culture, not on what you think are merit meritous in your own culture. You try to judge a culture based on its own precepts. And learn about the culture before you ever try to do any judgment. Um, it, one, of the, one of the things I did appreciate about Mace in this book is he does, to a certain extent, come to appreciate life in the jungle. He comes yeah. to understand that there's more to this than he at once thought. And so, uh, Emma, would you recommend this book as maybe a, a little bit more lighthearted material for a Star Wars fan wanting to interact with some of these deeper, darker themes about uh, the way the world works and how we interact with people who are not like us? Um, well, I would say don't come here if you want a lighthearted read. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's what I would say. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe not. That's a good point. That's a good point. Uh, Freddie, anything else you want to add on this topic before we... Uh, before we bring it uh, bring it down a little bit no no i th- i think it, it's it's a good read it's a good book it, honestly if i if i recommended this book to somebody i wouldn't recommend the book i'd recommend the audiobook because it's going to give you an experience that yeah. that you're not going to expect and it's going to give you a lot of drama it's going to make you feel kind of woozy at times just with how yeah. how intense everything is uh you know like jared said i i was running during one of one of the uh, you know he was talking about how exhausted he was and all his bruises and I got tired I felt exhausted just like you did <laughs> you felt this it, too yeah okay I wanted I wanted to give it my own shot so I listened to it again while I was working out and I just remember just feeling fatigued and I was like I just started what the heck <laughs> and it it um it's not a lighthearted book definitely if you're looking for something lighthearted there's other legends books for that uh, this one's gonna teach you a lesson and it's gonna make you think it's still cool. Yes. It's it's oh, got yeah. some awesome moments. I would say the moment where what is it the the little Coronai strike team comes down with jetpacks from from the waterfall <laughs> yeah. and they, there's like some unique music that they've never played in a Star Wars audiobook before, I don't think. It seemed like a like a really really tight original mix. I like whooped and hollered. I was out yeah. running. It sounds like Freddie and I have been ch- chugging marathons out here. <laughs> not not true, not true. Uh, I remember leaping and jumping and screaming. I was so excited. I It was the coolest moment I've ever experienced in reading a Star Wars book. And it's like so spoilery for like the grand climax of this book. We can't like, you know, play a clip of it or anything, but totally worth it. Very good there. So as we wind it down, I do want to ask, uh, has your opinion changed on this since we've been discussing it now for two weeks? Got, you know, a couple hours in on the nitty gritty on all this. Uh, I gave it what an 8.5 could have been an eight at least uh, last time around. Emma, you said you always amp up your rating on books. Has your opinion changed on this one? You it has. Give it a higher score last chance. It has. And I have changed for the better. Um, I just appreciate the themes more after discussing it. And, um, 
and certainly appreciate the the story as a whole more as well um, after hearing you guys talk about how it connects sort of to other legends things um, and so yeah I'm gonna up my score to a 7.2 I, I'm I'm feeling better about it I think my score previously was a six point. Eight yeah, something? y'all both gave it sixes. Just yeah, yeah. Me. So yeah, seven point two from me. Um, I definitely have a, a better appreciation for it after our discussions, like I always do. It's just, I mean, sometimes you just got to talk about it, you know. <laughs> definitely. How about you, Freddie? You wanna you wanna give it at least a seven now, or you wanna stick with your six point seven? <laughs> I think I think I'll go up to a seven seven point three seven. I'll go seven point three. Just just a little bit above Emma. There you go. Uh, mainly because. I, I gotta give it to this audiobook. Without that audiobook, I don't think it would it would have been enjoyable, but the the action scenes, uh reading that versus hearing it, it just sounds so much better. And the strike team, the you know, the the clone troopers coming down to to just, you know, do their thing, their military thing. And you could just hear I think someone in the chat said it earlier. It almost sounds like you can hear Fortunate Sun blaring in the background. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was <laughs> such a good, such a good comment. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. It, it, it's good. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I, uh, I just want to read this book while playing to remember the Titan soundtrack. We'll <laughs> see if it does any better on my uh, my third read through. Well, uh, I'm gonna give it somewhere between an eight and an eight point five. I don't remember exactly what my score was last time. Emma, did you write these down? I feel like you're I writing didn't, these down. I forgot. Okay, well. <laughs> Um, somebody was. It, some of our listeners are screaming at us uh, while walking their dog right now, which is fun. Hey, what's up? And uh, of course, I'll give it somewhere between the eight and eight point five. I think it's one of the deeper, more well-written Star Wars books. Appreciate that it sticks to one planet, one main character, but it is brutal. It is violent, and uh, sometimes too much for me. I'm queasy like that. All right, I got a weak stomach. Now, uh, no show next week, everybody. Thanks for joining us this week. Uh, no show next week. We're coming on a brief hiatus. But we will be back before you know it. Uh, jury's still out on exactly when um, as this uh, summer busyness and is hitting Freddie and me a little bit. So we'll be back pretty soon with uh, lots of great legendary content. we got some fun stuff in the pipeline that's going to be headed your way. Uh, however, the next roundtable, if you want to get some Legends reading in as you wait for our return, uh, next Legends roundtable. Freddie, you want to tell the good folks what they should be checking out? I don't know. Are are they ready for it? That's the question. Our next <laughs> took a long time to get there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> do, do you have it yet? Uh, Star Wars Insider Fiction Collection, Volume One. I cracked mine open, looked at the pictures, and put it on the shelf when I got <laughs> That's it. That's what I I'm, did. <laughs> I'm excited to dive into it. There's a Dash Rindar story. There's a Jaina Solo story. There's a Vader story. I mean. It's got everything, Freddie. So very excited about this. We're going to have our buddy Eric from The Living Forest joining us for that. And we're going to pick our favorite story and the weirdest story, in our opinion, for us to talk about. It's going to be a ton of fun. That does it for this week. Thanks for joining us for Legends Look Back. Thanks to our incredible patrons for your support. We love making this show, and we are glad you are along for the ride, and we want to make it even better. So we're going to come back with uh, some improvements here in a few weeks. Special thank you to Cheryl bell patrick ortiz carl sander and our new jedi high council member okay indar uh, and of course elizabeth elizabeth cloutier jason mitchell sally and chris eilerson and you know him and love him freddie c on our alliance high command thank you to all of you for your amazing support if you'd like your thoughts right on the show you can email us at legends look back at utini.com you can send us a message in the legends look back discord channel you can leave a comment on this episode on youtube i do read them you can find us on twitter at legends look back or more personally i'm at jared q mays freddie at wake up freddie and emma at irma jedi 26 excellent if you're looking to buy some of these books, such as you could get the the non-Legends banner version of Shatterpoint, you can get the Legends banner, you can get the hardback, you can pick up this brand new bad boy, the Essential Legends Collection Shatterpoint. You can get the audio book with your free um, Audible trial that we've got going over there on the site at utini.com. There's so many different ways that you can pick up a book through utini.com. You can click the links in the profile 
and of course throw a few cents our way to help us keep the lights on of course while you're over there you can leave us a review and let us know what you think we would love to hear your score and your review of these legends masterpieces as well remember everybody in the meantime we'll be back before you know it with some more legends content and as you wait please keep the utini fan code and be a force for positivity in the fandom may the force be with y'all